Um, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's upstate lecturer, Byron Mutan. Um, he is a um, New Orleans native that has worked in the field of architecture for over 15 years, um, educated at both Tulane and Harvard Graduate School of Design. His professional practice has included affiliation with several US and European firms. He's currently professor of practice at Tulane's University School of Architecture and collaborator in build design. And let me tell you a little about, about each of them, but I'm sure that's what he'll be doing tonight. Um, at Tulane, where he's entering his 10th year as educator, Byron teaches studios, material research, and coordinates their um, Central Europe Study Abroad program. Uh, but in response to the devastation created by Hurricane Katrina in that region, Byron has spent the last three years directing the school's urban build program. Students engaged in urban build studios are deployed to neighborhoods throughout the city to develop creative and sustainable urban design strategies, innovative designs for new housing, historic property inventories, and proposals for site-specific urban interventions, as well as large-scale mixed-use urban environments. But as an integral component of this program, students design and construct a prototypical house for each of the study neighborhoods in partnership with community nonprofit agencies that specialize in affordable housing and neighborhood redevelopment. And we're certainly looking forward to hearing how he manages to get that done. Um, also, Byron manages to find the time to both found and participate in build design, which is an assembly of architects, designers, and craftspeople each with their own portfolio and talent that come to, together to collaborate on build form. Build explores a variety of design-related projects by merging investigation of assembly and space with technical sophistication and material research. Designs range in project type and have been recognized nationally and internationally through awards and publication. I met Byron this past June when my six-year-old daughter and I traveled to New Orleans uh, to look at some of the post-Katrina housing construction, both the house that Global Green built in the Lower Ninth Ward in collaboration with um, Brad Pitt, the Brad Pitt initiative called Make It Right, as well as some of the students' work uh, that they built from Tulane. Um, Byron escorted us through what could only be described as pretty tough neighborhoods, where he clearly was regarded with respect. So adding to Byron's self-referenced occupations of residential framer, carpenter, custom wood finisher, and architect, I would add humanitarian, entrepreneur, and all-around nice guy. So please join me in welcoming Byron. Um, hello. Uh, thanks. That was a very nice introduction. And um, it's very nice to be here. Now, can you, can you hear me OK, or should I turn on this mic? Yeah. Is that better? Is that fine? No? It's, it's, it's on the on button. Got it now? Should I move that up? Okay. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to tell a, a, a few stories and, a, and, and I'm going to walk you through um, a series of events starting with what I was trying to figure out when I was in your spot. Whenever I'm asked to speak to a group like this, consisting primarily of, of students. I remember what I was trying to figure out when I was at that point in my uh, uh, career. You know, and, and it, it's pretty frightening when you start to think about things you did professionally 20 years ago. It means you're getting a little bit older. When, when, I, when I finished undergrad, I'm going to show you some work I call it background. And, and I show you this because it's important to the way that we function now in my studio as well as the way we run the program at Tulane called Urban Build. But I was always interested in, in materials and material assemblies. And that interest in New Orleans, um, I stuck around after uh, finishing in 1989 for a couple of years and then eventually went on to grad school. Uh, but during those five or six years, I really started to think about how we manipulate material. I, I was offered my first chance to teach. so I. I figured out a little bit how to manipulate a group of people to conduct the research that you want um, to achieve. And uh, that turned into a, a career, well, a short-lived career. For three, four years, I uh, was able to win a couple of grants and gather enough equipment to, to rent some space with some colleagues and start making 
furniture pieces, and those furniture pieces I discovered um, turned out to be a really great way to market what we do. And, and starting at the small scale uh, was, was really interesting for me. I had many colleagues who, who went immediately into practice with larger firms, but I started with the small, small scale, let's say, research and, and really uh, enjoyed that. And, began you know, at the age of 24, 25 to pick up jobs like this where I'd get phone calls from people who would say, we saw that table you made in, in you know, such and such as home and we had this rear yard shed or this garage or this pavilion and we'd love for you to, to take a look at it. And so for those few years, I was spending time between 89 and 96 conducting this research, making these interventions and, and really trying to figure out what it takes to practice, and uh, most importantly, I realized during that time that we don't work alone, that we really must rely upon very careful collaboration with many other people, builders, investors, clients, and so forth, and, and this idea of collaboration really uh, hit home with me regarding how I have continued to practice. Um, I, I ended up after 96, I finished grad school and, and, and ended up working in, in, in Austria, in Vienna, amidst an urban setting, and, and really began to love this idea of community involvement. That has a lot to do with why my firm is titled, titled or, or named Build Design rather than uh, Byron Mouton Architect. It's all about finding a way to represent the activities of the entire group. So with that as a background, right, to help you as, as, as uh, soon to be graduates, think about how you form a, an agenda uh, or, or let's say form a position, I offer that as, 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 as an example. That's how I started. <clears throat> so after living overseas, I returned um, to New Orleans with no intention to stay. I really was, was passing through to visit my family. I'm, I'm from there. And the work I'm going to show for the rest of the evening um, as Julia mentioned, I ended up sticking around longer than just a year. I've been back in New Orleans now uh, a little more than 10 years, or about 10 years. And um, since we're going to talk about activities there, I'm going to talk about the region briefly. As you all know, since Hurricane Katrina, I think more and more people know a little bit about uh, the nature of that context. We live amidst water. We rely upon water. Um, yet, at the same time, water is a threat. To the south is the Mississippi River. This is the French Quarter. That is Lake Pontchartrain. And although water is always viewed as, as, as a threat, as represented by the way we build there, and that is an exaggerated image, of course, it's also, it's also a condition that we rely upon. So that's why people tend to stay there. They're, 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 they're willing to put up with this threat because uh, the city is an authentically old European city in many respects. Um, the city also exists, as you all know now, below sea level. These are the pumping stations that are, are located throughout the context of that place. So every place you see a red dot, that's a station like this. And every color you see on this map, yellow to red, is below sea level, to give you an idea of, of what, we, what we live amidst. Um, and that really has had a very direct influence on the way we build there, our relationship to the earth, our relationship to ground, it also has something to do with, with uh, our, our, our love for patina and settlement. No, no, no affordable foundations there uh, stay flat for long. There's always movement amidst the structures. And I'm going to talk briefly about these building types because they influence the way I practice now and they influence the urban build program outcome. Right, the design build program that I run at Tulane University, uh, the prototypes the students um, design have a lot to do with the knowledge of these building types and with an ability to develop parcels, parcels of land shaped like that. That's, that's the most common lot condition of New Orleans, typically 30 feet wide. If you're lucky, it's 120 feet deep, but common, they're only 100 feet deep, sometimes only 60 feet deep. And so we, we call these substandard conditions, and we'll talk about that tonight. Um, the shotgun, the single shotgun, is, is, is one of the most common types of the region. Uh, and many of you know this type, I'm sure. And, and in, in addition to this familiar, familiar type that runs 
that, that, that exists throughout the city. There's also the shotgun double. This is a really interesting project or, or, or prototype because it exemplifies the, a culture, a very peculiar culture of that place where um, families either grow up generation after generation in one home. A very common condition of this place is a young, uh, uh, let's say, a, 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 some parents may provide for a young married couple or for their young married children the space next door. As the parents grow older, that those, th those children take care of the parents. Eventually, the married couple has their own family, and the cycle just continues to repeat itself. A very peculiar situation. When that's not the condition, it's not uncommon to rent one side of a house. I've done that. Many of my colleagues have done that. And you, and you live in very close proximity to the, the intimate nature of, of others. It's a very peculiar, bizarre situation where you know, you're separated by six inches of, of wood framing and plaster matter, and you hear everything that's going on in the next household. And, and it's a very different condition of urban density because at the same time, these houses are very airy, lifted from the ground for cooling purposes. The volumes of the homes are, are significant. Often the ceiling, the interior spaces are a common shotgun proportion is a 12 foot tall space that's 12 foot wide. It's, it's quite elegant, quite beautiful. And then there is the camelback shotgun. Um, this, this type was developed because once upon a time, uh, taxes were based upon the front elevation of your building based on a 45 degree angle laid out from the crown of the road back toward the edge of the end of the property. So you could, there was room to build vertically at the rear of the site, but not up front. And, and people made decisions to build this way to avoid excessive taxes, but it also helped us to preserve a very common condition of street front, right? The scale of the common neighborhood element is of that front portion, 12 feet plus three feet of foundation, plus the, the angle of the gable roof. You're, you're at around 18 feet tall. And that, that's a dimension that we, we strive to maintain throughout the city. So I bring this information to the table because that, those, those observations have a lot to do with what we do in practice and what the students do in, in the Urban Build program. Um, Another fact to keep in mind is uh, New Orleans, 33% of the people who live in the city live below the, uh, the poverty level. So in addition to examples of what we strive to do as designers, as architects, uh, I bring to the table also that we are, we're always aware of this issue of affordability. So we'll talk about that tonight as well. So this is where the conversation I'm going to drift back and forth. I, I, I have this position at Tulane called a professor of the practice. It, it's, it's a glorified adjunct position, right? It's, I'm an adjunct faculty member with some benefits. They give me health insurance, right? But my response is, oh, and I'm allowed to teach full time without limit, which is great. Um, the responsibility I have is to keep students in touch with professional activities. So, we're always talking not just about conceptual approach, not just about design strategy, but we do, in fact, discuss what's that made out of? How's that going to be held up? How do we afford that? How do we make that accessible to the uh, occupants of these neighborhoods? I'm also going to talk about what it means to use our creative uh, juices, so to speak, to stay afloat. I mean, I, this product I'm about to show you is the first house I did on my own. It's a renovation. And it's a story. Um, I, moved, I moved back to town and a friend of mine uh, convinced me to buy this old building. And he's like, look, it's been on the market. Nobody wants to fool with this. You have a background with, with woodworking and, and some carpentry and framing. You should, you should buy this place. And I'm like, yeah, that's my friend Nick. He's still my friend. And um, <laughs> I, 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 bought, I bought this place and, and um, <laughs> well, I made an offer. And the owner said yes. And then I'm like, oh, hell, what do, what do I do now? And, and um, because remember, I, I was coming back to New Orleans from overseas with the intention to just pass through, visit my folks. And in two weeks, 
uh, owned a house and was offered my first teaching position at Tulane University. And uh, I said, okay, I'll do this for a year. And it's, it's been a while. Here's, here's, here's why I showed this project. I have the opportunity to, to buy this place. I've got very, few, very little funds. I've got lots of skill and lots of time. Um, but again, very little funds. And I say, okay, if we start with this existing portion of the house and just fix it, then let's, let's identify what I can afford to build upon. Right? So the addition really played upon this idea of, of, let's say, a reconsidered shotgun camelback, where we, we build vertically at the rear of this building. It just so happened that the lot runs through, entirely through a city block. And I also said, okay, there's a market in the city where there are, whenever, this is way before Hurricane Katrina. At this time, this is 1998, 99, um, there was a, a thriving business where demolition crews would offer to take, if you wanted to build a new house and there was an existing house in the way, <coughs> demolition crews would offer to take apart that house in exchange for the material. So you could buy old material, old units, old windows. And then people who were trying to replicate these homes would go to these salvage yards and try to buy matching sets of windows. But no one ever wanted to buy the leftover windows, right? They never wanted to buy the one-offs. So those were very, very affordable. And the attitude was, or the idea was, okay, let's, let's build upon this minimum footprint a three-story structure. Let's carefully control the circulation through that structure, and then let's just clad this rear facade with whatever we find. And I, I built this myself with um, a crew that I, I still, to this day, work with there in New Orleans, and we, we clad this project with what we found. And at the base was my shop, that was my living room, and that was eventually my studio. And I stayed here, it's a triplex, and well, that's the other part of the project I didn't tell you about. This was an old triplex which allowed me to find a way to sort of um, <coughs> afford to own a building because I'm generating some revenue from the other two units. And, and I got into this thinking, okay, I'd do this and I'd flip it, or I started to think after a couple of years that I would do this and I'd stay there for a while. Well, in a little while, I'll, I'll tell you what, what happened. But this is the project. I lived there, kept teaching, kept working on this project, um, finished out the inside bit by bit. And then one day, I get a phone call from a friend of mine, uh, Don Gatsky. Don's now dean at uh, UT Arlington. And he says, look, there's a piece of property that um, I found, and uh, we can get it for cheap. To give you guys an idea, in New Orleans, you can buy, to this day still, you can buy empty plots of land in, in, in not great neighborhoods, but in neighborhoods that are, are in close proximity to, uh, uh, to the university or to downtown. You can buy these empty lots sometimes for $40,000, $50,000. But we can use our skills to, to find a lot like that, make drawings describing what's, what can be placed upon that lot, bring those drawings to a bank, the bank appraises those drawings, and then they're willing to lend you a little money. And um, maybe that has a little bit to do with the crisis we're in now, but, um, but that's, that's, how, that's, how I sort of, that's how I started. I was able to convince the bank to lend me money based upon uh, the skills that we have, the drawings that I could produce. And we found this lot. I still didn't have enough money to, to put down on the project, but then I discovered this, this term called equity, right? This first project that I, I, I sort of did on my own and, and worked on for a few years gained equity. It was worth more than what I had put into it. And it, that's what's called sweat equity. We, some of us know that. Um, we, I was able to use that house to generate the, uh, the down payment for this project. And this time, the lot was very close to the river. I'll show you here again, right? There's the Mississippi River. And Don wanted to just do a little rental property, a little rental portion. I wanted to play around with this game of, of, of extended view. You know, um, He wanted to do this as, as a project that we could crank out quickly and then maybe sell. I said, no, let's do this as a project that we split, and maybe I live in one side. And to this, to this day, I live in this project. Um, to give you an understanding, the entire city is surrounded by this levee berm, this mound of earth, to help control flooding. Because of that, we're not aware of the activities of the river. I mean, this is, 
a photograph that cl clearly describes domestic proximity to the industri in industry of the river. It's a, it's a bizarre situation. And, and I was really, I've been really interested in trying to reconnect to this, this issue, of the, this, this sort of condition of the place. That's why the name of tonight's lecture is In Search of Higher Ground. I've been really thinking about this idea now for quite some time. How do we, how do we that's what was on this site that we dismantled before we, we started building. How do we build upon, you know, how do we, we build vertically in effort to gain access to this view of the river, to the activities of industry? And then the plan, just quickly, we're not going to go into all of these plans tonight, but quickly, this is the common lot type. It's a little bit wider than some. And the problem with the typical shotgun is that you en enter on one end and must walk through all rooms to get to the rear. And we decided with this scheme to re re relocate entry to the center so that we can easily bring people in and distribute them efficiently without needing to move through a series of, of rooms or without needing to, to build a series of hallways. And when we get into the student projects and we talk about the issue of affordability, we'll talk about that, that condition of circulation, right? The hallway is, is a portion of the scheme that we lose. For example, with this scheme, uh, the stairway the stairwell becomes our best friend because we, we get to use that square footage over and over again. We're able to move in that square footage and we're able to use top side and underside of that square footage as well. So the, the idea that, they, that we might have a, a reduced footprint in effort to build vertically um, has much more meaning now in a post-Katrina environment than it did back then. This is the scheme, right? This is my home. Uh, that is the view we gain to the river. So from this, from this window, we see the, the river beyond. Um, here, here this, this photograph, uh, Neil Alexander, a friend of mine, took this. This, this, ex this describes the idea that there's one opening that's about direct relationship to the ground. That's about the neighborhood. There's another opening which is about this extended relationship to the, to the vicinity. And so this project we worked on um, and one day, I get a knock on the door from a young guy, uh, Matthew Conke. He's about 29 years old. He says, hey, man, I like this house. Who did it? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I did that. And then I discovered the power of marketing, right? All, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I, I'm realizing that, okay, now we can, we can sort of use our skills to create work. Um, we don't have to rely upon people to, to sort of spread word. So now I have really big signs everywhere in New Orleans, and it, and it, it works pretty well. And the website works well, too. Um, but this is the, pro the project Matthew brought to the table. He had a piece of property also near the river. And this is the lot. This is considered, this is a substandard lot. It's 30 feet wide, 90 feet deep. And Matthew says that he wants to build a, a, a duplex on this site. I'm like, Matthew, that's really not easy. But again, it gave me the chance to, ver to, to justify this idea of, of vertical uh, extension, vertical growth. And we got to work on this project. We developed a strategy, quite clear, where there's one unit. It's the same layout as the previous house. There's a rental at the ground. There's a vertical component toward the rear. This scale is about the maintenance of the street edge. You'll see pictures later. This scale is about the, 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 the relationship to the river, right? the, the relationship to industry. And we work on this for uh, really, really quickly. This is the same crew that we built the first house with. And we get the house wrapped up, um, and, and we've got our final inspections scheduled for uh, the 29th of August, 2005. You know, you, you would think I made this up. This is a true story. That is the day that Katrina hit the city, right? So here we are. You know, I've got this house sort of wrapped up, ready for final inspection not thinking about uh, resilience in terms of the threat of hurricane. I'm thinking about making a cool metal house that has a view to the river. And all of a sudden, this hurricane hits the city, and I start to really think again about what we do and how we might ironically be able to um, do these things again. So let's take a break. The, the, the hurricane hits the city. You understand this map now. There's Lake Pontchartrain, there's the river, there's the French Quarter. Uh, this is Audubon Park. That is Tulane University. That is City Park. Um, 
this is how much of the city was inundated with water. This is old news, right? But this graphic still is, this graphic is still fairly powerful. Um, what's funny is if you compare what we're left with to a map of the city from 1878, it's proof that, that our ancestors knew what they were doing, right? That just to, just to, to, to give you a little background, the, um, those pumping stations that I showed you earlier tonight, those were finished. The installation of that drainage system was completed about 1925. And um, when that was finished, mid-city, which is this, you know, the middle of the city, which is the lowest portion of, of, the, of, the, of the, the metropolitan area, it was the last to be pumped dry. So all of a sudden, 1925, 1935, 45, 65, a few decades pass and, and people forget about the threat of water. Right? They forget about the threat of flooding. They, 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 they forget that we're below sea level. And they, they begin to rely upon these pumping stations. And, and, and we know now that was a, a mistake. And, and houses were beginning to be, after 1925, post-World War II houses, after 1945, 1950, houses were beginning to be constructed slab on grade using you know, very cost-effective methods that should never have been allowed to be used there. When you get back to the city, um, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. This is what we return to in the city. Um, the hurricane hit uh, New Orleans and we were evacuated um, for quite some time. We were not really able to get back into the city for um, six weeks. I could not get back for six weeks myself. The stench was unbelievable. Imagine an entire city full of rotten food, right? I mean, the, the people were dragging their refrigerators out, <laughs> leave, leaving them on the side of the road, and you would drive into town, and it was, it was painful. I mean, it was absolutely painful. And Reed Krolov was, was dean at the time. He, he calls me. <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, Reed calls me. By this time, I'm evacuated. I'm in Lafayette, um, Louisiana. Can't get back into town. Reed finds me. He calls me. He says, he says, hey, um, uh, Byron, this is Dean Kroloff. I'm like, yes, I know, I know. He says, um, Duke Ryder, who's a, who some of you might, you might know, Duke Ryder is, is the dean, at, or was the dean at Arizona State University, also a Tulane alum. He had offered um, facilities for us to relocate our, our student body to ASU well, our fifth year, our graduating class, relocate them to ASU to keep, that, keep them on track for graduation. Ree calls me, says, listen, we've got this opportunity. I'd like you to move to Phoenix and run this program. I'm going to send you and four other faculty. And I say, I say, Reed, man, I don't want to go to Phoenix. And he, he rephrases the proposition. He says, he says you're going to Phoenix. <laughs> Because, because at that time, I didn't have this position, professor of the practice, and he had received orders from the administration to lay off all faculty that were not tenured um, our visitor, period. So he sort, of, he sort of kept me in the loop by sending me to, to ASU. And it's a great story because it, it, it proves what we can do when we're a little bit inconvenienced, right? Here I am all of a sudden in, in Arizona, in Phoenix, very different. There's not, there's not so much water there. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have flooding. It's hot as hell. Um, it's, uh, there are these things called scorpions, you know. And um, uh, we get there, and we've got to invent in 10 days a curriculum for these students and get them on track and write syllabi for uh, five classes. And, and we, we sort of sit down and we, we get this done. And we, we, we decide, okay, let's... Let's think about what we are going to return to. Let's respond here in Arizona. Let's respond to this Katrina event, and let's think about what we can do when we, when we return. And I'm going to show you just a couple of projects. As the students were asked, we broke them up into groups. Some were asked to make urban proposal. How do we reinvent neighborhood? Some were asked to, to, to redefine the, the idea of dwelling. How do we make homes that might be a little more resilient in the future? And you know, this is what we call the Brad Pitt 
response, right? Where in areas like the Ninth Ward or, or the Desire neighborhood, where literally it was wiped, the slate was wiped clear, we have to really rethink about the fabrication of neighborhoods from the ground up. And, and this is one really clear solution where we drop nodes into the landscape and we let those nodes instigate development. The other proposition, which I'm actually much more, um, uh, I have much greater faith in, is, is one that demonstrates, let's say, respect for the existing fabric of that place. And rather than just step into the vacant land and, and reconstruct or refabricate a neighborhood, let's start by, let's start at the edge, at the fringe. Let's, let's think about the reestablishment of neighborhood with reliance upon what is already there. And that really has become the foundation for the school's urban build program. Um, you know, we, 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 we suggest with this drawing that we, we, we use what's existing, we, re, we repair what's broken, and then we add on to that edge. And in fact, um, we proposed, the Make It Right Foundation met with us at Tulane, and we, we proposed this direction rather than what they're doing now, and they, they wanted nothing to do with this. And, and I, I understand, they really wanted a blank canvas uh, to, to practice some freedom. Students, while we're at ASU, they begin to develop strategies, and, and they're, they're doing what students should do. They're being a little bit aggressive, they're being a little bit uh, manipulative, they're, they're trying to take advantage of the situation. And we're talking, we begin speaking about the refabrication of neighborhoods, but we never, we know we could never return and build neighborhoods. As a, as a student body, as, as, as faculty. We could, make, we could work as planners, but we were interested in returning and, and getting our hands dirty, so to speak. And so we, we started to quickly concentrate on uh, the, the idea of the dwelling, the redefined dwelling. And the, uh, the slogan we in, we've invented and that we maintain is we're trying to rebuild neighborhoods one house at a time. And we, we would talk with the students immediately about Okay, listen, before we start making proposition, let's carefully think about what's there. So we, we return to the idea of the shotgun. The shotgun is a pretty fantastic idea where the body of the building is always the same, but the face, the makeup, the cladding can, can change. There's great variation provided. We talked about the idea of the camelback, the idea of vertical extension, right, the maintenance of the street edge. We spoke about all of the parts, the pieces, and we, 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 we would ask students to consider carefully how we dismantle what's there in effort to redefine what might uh, be provided next. How do we maybe start with what we know and reconfigure that in a number of ways? How do we radically rethink the idea of the duplex? Right? How do we take advantage of that culture's willingness to live in such close proximity to each other? <clears throat> How do we maybe develop house types that allow a young couple to move in while renting out another side or allow a multi-generational family to, to return again? And these were the points at the end of that time at ASU. These were the questions that the students defined. One, what is the relationship between the natural and the built environment, environments in New Orleans? Two, who are we repairing the city for? Will the city shrink significantly in population? Will the built landscape condense? Now keep in mind, this is all, we're, this is way before any return to the city. So we're really uh, guessing. Three, how do we invest in neighborhood development and reconnect marginalized parts of the city? Or how can we take advantage of the post-Katrina circumstance to investigate pre-Katrina problems? How do we, in fact, address issues of, pro of poverty and crime? Because that's, that was and still is a problem in the city. And finally, finally, will we rebuild the city with traditional methods? To what degree do we introduce new strategies for storm protection and the, and the city development as a whole? So that's how we end our time in, in Arizona. We return to New Orleans December, okay? So I'll pick up where I left off. I, I get back, this is the condition you know, of the city. Um, Neighboring houses now have uh, different roof systems, you know. Neighboring houses have lost their cladding. Um, they, they've lost their, their roof. In fact, you see the, the subtle discoloration there between the metal panels? Um, this roof blew off. It was an old slate roof and, and dinged my house, 
right? It's like a bad parking lot. And, and so I had, to replace, I had to replace that whole wall. And in fact, to let you know how, just how anal I am, that discoloration drove me crazy. I just, I just took all the metal down and replaced the entire wall. And it looks much better now. And, and I got rid of the seam. It's all now, they're big pieces now. But this, is the, 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 this was, a, this was a, a neighborhood park that the, the house used to overlook. I returned and it's now a, a FEMA trailer park. And that's, that was cool. These people were great. They needed a place to live. These were in fact housed, these, these trailers housed staff at the university. This, this house is only a few blocks from the university. But we got it finished. And, um, and all of a sudden I'm thinking differently now about what it means to build upon a smaller footprint. I'm thinking differently now about what it means to build affordably. I'm thinking differently now about this term I call um, anticip anticipated customization, right? Where, where, and this, this comes into play with the, the urban build houses I do with students now. In an effort to save money, we go with really affordable surfaces, gypcrete systems. We go with sheetrock walls, all painted one color. The idea being that in the future, if someone um, houses this place, they then have the chance to move in. If someone buys this place or rents this place, they have the chance to move in and clad the walls, paint the walls, change the interior. So the idea of the, of the position we've adopted is we keep the, the insides, well, not this, right? right? The inside of these projects we do are, are really stripped, stripped clean so that we can, that's really done in anticipation of, of the new owner, okay? That's that scheme. Okay, get back, I get that, that house finished, um, and Ree Kroloff and Isla Berman, uh, in the meantime, had been pursuing this HUD grant to start a program called Urban Build. Um, Isla was going to pursue urban research, and uh, I was told that I was going to pursue a research at the, square, the scale of dwelling. And I'm like, okay, that's great. I'd love to do that. And she says, we've got um, two years to build four houses. I'm like, whoa, Isla, that's not easy. I'm like, with who? She says, with, she says, with students. <laughs> and then I, get to, I start to think a little bit. I'm like, oh, my God, can we do this? And I'm going to run through the next series of events because I'm really um, concerned I mean, about this responsibility that I've been handled. Um, and we, we, we start to think about what this means, what we're, what we're getting ready to, to step into. And I have to back up. Reed and Isla pursued the HUD grant, but the idea of urban build was actually invented by a classmate of mine, I'm sorry, a, 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 a co-worker of mine, another faculty member, Doug Harmon. He had been thinking about this idea of, of, of starting an urban build program and had actually came up with the term urban build and they were getting ready to start a program the same semester that Hurricane Katrina hit. So I have to always give Doug a little credit. He really did devise this concept. Um, and, and, and he and I actually, were, this, this is Doug right there. That's me with more hair. And um, this, this is the mission of the program. <clears throat> it was focused on affordability and innovation uh, for the design and full construction of projects in the urban context of New Orleans. That's what we we should be thinking about. And the intent was to, to provide a rich, comprehensive experience for the students, of course, while at the same time um, hoping to benefit the city by introducing structures of quality and <laughs> design excellence. Now this, that, that's really important because when we started the program, the practitioners in the city were, became really concerned that we might begin offering design services for free because we do that too much in this business. And um, we had a meeting with, with a number of reps of the local AIA. And my response to them was, listen, you know, we're building houses for clients that A, could never really afford to hire us anyway. And that's our promise to you. We, we've teamed up with, a, with a, a nonprofit. They sell houses to people, and, and the people who buy these houses agree not to resell them for profit for a certain, a certain number of years. It's, it's, it's bound in writing. And then I also said that, look, we can get more examples on the streets of other options for you. I'm speaking to the, the, the other architects. We can put examples on the streets for you to show 
your own clients, right? Like we're, we're, we have the opportunity here to produce other examples of what we can do. And that's important in a city like New Orleans that is, is just smothered by its own love for nostalgia, right? I mean, people in New Orleans love the old New Orleans buildings. And to, and to practice there uh, in effort to be progressive is not easy. It's not easy at all. So the architects of the community bought into that strategy. And, and now they're incredibly supportive. They, they, in fact, last year, I convinced some of them to give us money. So it's really turned around quite a bit. Community partnership, how do we work with neighborhood housing services? Well, the point is to combine efforts with a local community organization and develop a shared vision. And, to, and we, we hope to build upon developed neighborhood relationships that are already in place. We approached organizations that were already there. And I tell you, we were welcomed with open, open arms. Um, we had to negotiate a little bit, and there was often concern for what would what we do, what, what would it end up looking like. There was really some fear uh, regarding regarding that issue. But the first house, the first program we did, I think, uh, gained helped us to gain some trust. Quickly, I'm going to run through. This was the first project, the first studio. The students, and the way it works is in six weeks, the students uh, develop strategies. These are those strategies. They, they, they develop multiple options. They develop schemes, and they draw them up for criticism, for discussion. And the schemes vary in complexity and language and, let's say, um, uh, extremity. Um, and we talk about ideas of what it means to make a house. What does it mean to make some parts off-site, some parts on-site? What does it mean to maintain the nature of a neighborhood? And this is the house they chose to build. And, and when, we, when we had the vote, it was interesting. Um, we, uh, myself and other faculty, um, we, we don't vote in these situations. We, we let the students vote. And they understood this, right? They understood that there, there was a responsibility to maintain this connection to the scale of the neighborhood, while also uh, were obligated to respond to the new FEMA regulations, which identify construction benchmarks per neighborhood. So in some neighborhoods of the city, we can build a legal home three feet off the ground. In some neighborhoods of the city, that, that, that home would need to be six are eight feet off the ground. So there's incredible variation. So the idea of the, the sort of uh, expandable threshold was the point of this scheme. On top of that, we're building the first site we were given to work on was in one of the city's protected historic districts. So wow, the, the preservationists are all over us. They are really worried about what we're going to do. And, and um, I learned uh, the definition of diplomacy and, and uh, politics, and, and I learned how to be uh, very nice and patient. And we were able to, I say we, really, we would meet with them as a, as a body, myself and the students, and we would show them uh, what, we're, what we were going to do um, a little bit at a time. And that has a little bit to do with the, the sort of conventional language and, and, and in form of the structure. There was an attempt there to, to pay respect for what's familiar. Here's the, the lot, common lot, 30 feet wide, 120 deep. The strategy is really based upon this sort of public bar, this private bar, with the idea that this could be converted. If we build a wall there, we could convert that to a, a small apartment for rental to help, to help subsidize the home. Uh, and then there's the front porch. And there's the scheme. <clears throat> And this is the work the students did in preparation for construction. Um, and, 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 and they made renderings, you know, we all do this now in school, but they made renderings that really helped us to understand how this would relate to that, how the activities of this zone would relate to the activities of the street, um, how we might make portions of the scheme that are uh, expandable, how we might choose to detail certain elements that are operable, so that the owner has a chance to, to move in and, and play with the mechanisms of, of this place. And then we had 12 weeks to build the house. 
And this is what we get. This is the site, right? We, adro- we arrive on site, and I'm like, oh, my God. And, 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 and I, I'm using much, much filthier language than that. And um, we, we arrive, and we've got to clear the site. So we get it done. We, 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 we trench the foundation. We learn, uh, the students learn how to be, become masons. See this guy? This guy is um, the savior. This is uh, Sam Richards. He, um, he co-directs this program with me. Um, He's uh, educated, he's a sculptor, believe it or not, but he's educated at Cooper Union. He's smart. He can build, and this is really no exaggeration, he's not afraid, he can build anything out of any material. I mean, the, I mean, the, guy, the guy is, at, he's a really a great friend, and we, we collaborate and practice as well on, on quite a number of things. But the students just go at it, right? I mean, they, they work like fiends getting this, this place pulled together. And the first house we build using familiar methods. Sam and I look at each other. I'm like, Sam, how the hell are we going to get this done in 12 weeks with with a a group of rookies? And he says, we're going to do it the way we know how. We're going to do it using conventional Western platform framing because he and I know how to do that. And and, and we agree that before we take on any other options for, for construction systems, we've got to We've got to prove first that we can do this with students. And this is the outcome of the scheme. Um, the students did a great job. That's Emily Taylor. She's the third participant. This program is run by three of us. Uh, myself, I'm the program director. Sam is the director of construction. And, and Emily is the project manager. And, and it really takes, and we each, when this house is under construction, it takes each of us about 20 hours a week minimum, maybe a little more here or there. We built this place for about 100 bucks a square foot. Now, that's direct cost. That's what it cost us to build it. Market cost would be a little higher, and, and we'll get into this, because um, the students are, well, they're, they're architecture students, and they don't want to just build a, a, um, a habitat house. They want to do something that's a little bit more exploratory, and they want to try some things out and they want to make special doors and they want to, they want to think about conditions of, of canopy in some unconventional ways. So um, although we consider this to be fairly conventional amidst this arena, um, to the neighbors of this community, this is quite an, an, an unconventional proposition. This is the man who bought the house. This house was not sold to a family, which still upsets me, but this fellow's name is Timothy. He's fantastic. He's a New Orleans police officer. And he, I'm glad he bought this house. These neighborhoods we're working in are the toughest in the city, like the toughest. These, these are rough zones. And um, it was great to see the house taken on by someone who might have a, a great shot at becoming a community leader, so to speak. And this is great. Remember those white walls, right? Within three days, Timothy's moved in and he's painted this place. You know, he's, he's, he's taking ownership. He, he ripped out the, the cheap countertops we installed and he's trying to get some nice tile countertops and he's doing the work himself. And, and we learned a little bit through this experience with house number one. The criticism in the final review was, hey, you know, um, that's a really great house you guys did, but it's not very prototypical. It, looks, it really looks like a sort of a cool custom home. And when we started the next research, the the next body of research, that was the agenda. I said to the students, listen, we've got to think now carefully about the assemblage of a house reliant upon a number of components, some which are factory made off site, some which we may make ourselves on site. And these are the strategies the students begin to uh, develop. And what's really interesting at this point is you would these students did not build the first house, but they were willing to take ownership of it immediately. I mean, they came into this, now having seen their peers do it, they came in just knowing they could do this with incredible confidence. And, and so what that means is the proposals become a little more extreme, right? I mean, and we start to have conversations. Okay, guys, this is an academic setting. We're going to develop some strategies that we can build. We're going to develop some strategies which we know we cannot build, but they may still nonetheless be very good ideas. And so this idea of the re- reduced footprint becomes really powerful. Um, this is a, a scheme developed by this young guy named Tyler. 
Um, but in the end, they have to again vote on a strategy, and this is the strategy they decide to pursue this go-round, which makes sense to me, right? It's about the development of these two roof forms that can be expanded. They can move side to side to fill a wider lot. They can slip from, from front to rear to deal with, with more or lesser deep lots, okay? Uh, and we're giving a, a new neighborhood to work in. This is the central city neighborhood, and the scheme, um, took great form. This, this is the strategy. And this time, we say, OK, we're being a little bit more ambitious, uh, a, a little bit more extreme. In addition to that, let's now build this scheme using a new system. And we, we're gaining, myself and Sam included, we're gaining a little more confidence. We don't need to rely upon the familiar anymore. We don't need to build this using a wood frame system. Uh, let's think about other options we have to build this project. So we start, of course, with a familiar foundation, a foundation that we know, <clears throat> and we build a, a wood deck because we wanted this deck to be exposed to the elements. But we decided this time to work with um, a metal fabricator out of Arlington, Texas. And we sent them drawings. They sent us shop drawings. The students make the drawings. The students review the shop drawings. The panels arrive. This is the entire house on one truck, with the exception of the roof joist. And what was phenomenal about this experience was the speed and the, the precision um, gained by using this system. We had this house up and, and, and sheathed in about two weeks, which is pretty good. Um, and we let that idea of the metal structure influence the idea of, of, of cladding as well. Um, let's talk about the disadvantages that we learned, that we, we, we learned about. While the metal was lightweight, easy to handle, um, st straight and true, we had some problems. We had to then all of a sudden be careful with issues of galvanic, galvanic corrosion. <clears throat> the plumber could not let copper components touch the, the steel. We had a, with the, the, the electrician could not pull his Romex through the studs, so we had to encase all electrical runs in, in metal conduit. Uh, the fastening inside of the drywall was a little more, uh, it was slower, a little more complicated. So on one hand, we learned, and that's the point of these programs, on one hand, we learned that, okay, we need to try these systems out. We also learned that we're not always going to be right, that sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And although we ended up with a, with a nice product and a, and a higher level of completion and infill, uh, I'm sorry, uh, completion inside, um, I don't think I'd ever do a house with students this way again, with, with metal. I think it was a little trickier. <clears throat> Before I show you the last urban build house, I'm going to show you a couple of projects that I'm working on now. And, I, and I'm doing this really to make a point. You know, as faculty, we hope that, that students are um, influenced by what we say. But it's important, for, I think, for students to, to know that as practitioners, we're often influenced by, by the things you bring to the table. And, and so you'll see, and I'm going to show you two out of three projects right now. Um, and these are projects built not, these are not affordable. These are built for clients in neighborhoods that were devastated by water. They, they were built, well, they're almost finished. They're being built for clients that, um, did receive, did receive insurance settlements, so we could be a little more um, extreme with the strategies. But one house is in Lakeview. Another house is in Gentilly. Um, and this is the scheme. All of a sudden now, we're dealing in neighborhoods that received eight to nine feet of flooding. And these clients, of course, um, don't want that again. So. And these are a little bit, these are less urban settings. These are more suburban. So the priorities are, A, we want a house lifted from the ground so we don't get wet again. B, we want to, wouldn't it be great to have a covered parking spot, right? That's, a, that's what every suburbanite wants. Um, and my proposition, what I brought to the table was, well, hell, if we're going to do all that, we might as well make a really great covered outdoor space to occupy. So. From that point forward, we would talk about these zones as spaces that were built in anticipation of flood, but there were spaces that were built for occupation and for use.
that once in a while you might be able to park in. Right? We, we sort of lessened the importance of the car and, it, and increased the importance of habitat <clears throat> at, these, at these projects. And the scheme, like you saw in the student project, I, I, I totally borrowed this idea that, okay, yeah, we, we are far removed from the earth. And that gives us a great underside to use for outdoor cooking and, and crawfish boils and gumbos and all that stuff we do down there. But we also have to think about this idea of the landing, the idea of the, the sort of exaggerated stoop in effort to maintain some consistency with the neighborhood. And here's the plan, right? These, this is all of the covered outdoor space. There's an entrance at the front, an entrance at the center, public zone, private zone. And this is where we are now. Regarding affordability, Still, to this, to this day, we, we can't find a more affordable cladding system, other than vinyl siding, than, than cementitious fiberboard, hardy panel, clapboard, hard, uh, four by eight sheets. And so we, 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 we use these materials, but we've tried to invent some edging, and ed edging details, which introduce this familiar material to, to a new condition of assembly. We're not using wood corner boards, we're using uh, plaster reglets, rather, at the edges. And, 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 and these are not affordable options, but they work. Um, we have to think with these products, now that we're lifting them from the earth, we've got to think about shear in two directions. Uh, we've, got, we, we've got the opportunity now to, to use some steel, because the funding is a little greater with these projects. There is, with this idea, um, this project, an idea of slippage from inside to outside. So fenestration becomes important. It's carefully placed. <clears throat> and the idea is, since we're removing these people from the ground, we, we offer as many opportunities as possible to um, step outside. So in the round, we get these, these uh, exterior balconies off a number of, of uh, faces, so to speak. Now, this project is raised on, on concrete block walls with some steel legs. Raising the project like that adds about uh, $40,000 of cost to the scheme, <clears throat> which is a chunk of change for these clients. I mean, to give you an idea, you, you, uh, we're building a different world. We're building that house uh, for about 150, 160 a square foot, right? That house in, 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 in a place like, uh, well, in many places, but that house in a place like California would cost about 250 275 a square foot to build. So we're dealing with a different culture in New Orleans. It, it, it is a culture of the, of the, I don't want to say the impoverished in this respect, but it is a culture of, of the middle class. And um, I bring that up because this is the next project I'm going to show. Another client also lost his home to flooding. He wants to build also on his site. He wants to build in, in anticipation of the threat of flood, but he doesn't have the funding. He doesn't have the extra $40,000 it takes to lift this house from the, gr from the ground. So the scheme becomes much denser, much more consolidated. And he gives me a list one day of what he considers to be the, the disposable components of his household. He says, these are the things I'm willing to, to let be flooded. And these are the things that are precious. So at the ground level is his um, wardrobe, his television room, his bedroom, um, his washer and dryer, and his car, right? That says, that says a lot about Jim's priorities, I think, right there. Upstairs, is, he's a painter. He's an artist. So this is the same. This is the program that you guys have been pursuing locally. Upstairs is his painting studio, his kitchen, his dining room, and his, his office, right? a little guest room. And that, that says a lot. Um, and the strategy is, is, is quite clear. We enter off the, the front edge. Because the budget is limited, we have to really consolidate the scheme in form. It can't be too, um, too figured. Uh, so um, it's quite a massive proposal. And, and again, we decide, OK, yeah, we might be introducing a different language to this place. There are certain elements that we can, we can borrow, that we can reference, without direct replication. Right? And I talk about this a lot. There's a difference between preservation and replication. Right? That, that is, that is um, really something that pays respect to what we find. 
but it's fresh. It's new, right? The materials are different. We use stainless handrails. We use expanded metal for, for, the, for the guardrail. This is almost finished. I wish, I wish it was, right? This is his, this is, now this is a funny story. On one hand, Jim's very urban. He doesn't care if his car gets flooded. But on the other hand, he wants a garage, right? So we have these discussions, and he's, he's fairly, um, that we make as the, as the fabricator, as the architect. Um, so this is, you know, this, this should be finished really um, next week, I believe. That's his, his deck off of his sleeping area into the backyard. <clears throat> and what's interesting, a project like this, I work with a builder, but I always preserve a portion of the project to, to fabricate myself. So Sam Richards, the fellow I pointed out earlier, he and I make, you know, we make this stuff. We made this, we make the handrails, and we're getting ready to build the shutter system for the previous house that I showed you. And that's, that's how we practice now. And, and it, it, keeps us, it keeps us in good, good terms with the builder in many ways. I mean, it really, one day I was working on the, on the, on the, hand, on the guardrail, and the general con contractor shows up, and he's, he's complaining to me about my punch list. And I said, I said, look, when you finish, I'll finish, right? Like, like it's sort of, it's sort of, it's an, e it's a great equalizer the way that we practice, and also, an effort to be successful and frankly, make some money at the scale of residential work. This is the only way I'm finding to do it, where, where, I'm practicing as, as architect, as well as, builder part of the time. I think it's the only option we have, <clears throat> now in practice at this scale. Um. Inside. The last project I'll show you now is the final urban build project. Um, the first house, we talked about the reasoning for using wood frame systems. The second house, we used a prefabricated metal panel system. I talked a little, a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of the metal system, but we did, we did realize that the prefabricated panelized components were, were that, was a, that was a successful strategy. So this time we said, okay, let's, let's reduce the unfamiliar nature by going with a wood system, OSB. The students develop a series of, of, of proposals, always knowing that we'll use uh, um, SIPs, sometimes in combination with other systems. And again, you see, each semester they up the ante, right? right? Each semester the schemes become a little more sophisticated, uh, a little more, uh, let's say, uh, extreme. Again, a little bit, uh, they're, they're a little more optimistic and sometimes a little less affordable, so to speak. But nonetheless, the, they're getting better at this. And, and one thing that strikes me every year we do this, every, every semester, is it is so hard for students to design the floor plan of a home. I mean, it, it's, it's such a, a, a tight exercise that I'm, I'm always quite um, thrilled when I, I see it done well, when I see it done successfully. And these were the prototypes that were developed, but not the prototypes that were chosen. Um, this scheme uh, was developed by a, a student named Amarit, this idea of this sort of core that would house all of the wet components, and then th that component would be placed from site to site, and then clad with all of the, the, the dry components, so to speak. <clears throat> and this is another scheme developed by a, a fellow named Carter Scott, where he says, okay, let's take advantage once again of this, uh, of this idea about the reduced footprint. Let's, let's, let's reduce the cost of foundation. Let's build vertically. Let's pack them in, a rental, and then a two-story home. Uh, let's think about this idea of cladding in, 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 in a familiar yet new way. Uh, but this is the scheme that they chose to build uh, last year, which was um, initiated by this young woman from Trinidad. And the strategy was, was, was quite clear. We're working in the same neighborhood, but the strategy was all about this idea of this continuous edge, this metal line that was sometimes roof, sometimes cladding, sometimes soffit, sometimes cladding again. Um, and what's great about this strategy, this time the nonprofit gave, <laughs> this is a funny story, Rand, Randy Michelson, one of the directors of NHS, says to me, he says, you guys are doing such a great job. I can't believe what you're coming up with. I'm going to give you a site that nobody can figure out. He gives us a site to work on that's, 60, he says, 60 feet deep, 30 feet wide. 
and we develop strategies for that site without needing to rely upon any requested variances. So we abide by all legal setbacks, and all of a sudden, the footprint of the scheme is reduced to a tiny little square. And the students still want to have covered outdoor space. They still want to have porches and decks and stoops. And they figure that out. And, and then we go out there to measure the site, and we get a different measurement. Then finally, we get the survey, and we get the right measurement. And the students keep responding to these subtle changes through development. But this is what they ended up with. And it's, 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 it's really quite, I think it's the best scheme so far, where they, they, they enter uh, into this space. And sometimes this could be, depending on how you develop this, this could be kitchen, that could be dining. This could be kitchen, that could be dining. We could flip this around, that could be living room. But the idea is we step in, and then the whole room is, is also hallway. Here's the stair. The underside of stair is, is uh, television, entertainment. The top side of stair at, uh, or at the upper landing, we, 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 we arrive and we, we step into the space. Wet walls are back to back. We get a master suite. We get two children's bedrooms. It's, it's tight. And the rooms are of a nice size. Um, and, and they render this thing. They model this thing. But eventually, we get into building it. And, and we go through the same initial uh, early steps, foundation, uh, framing of the first floor. But then the panels arrive. And, and they, they go up quickly. And the, the, the students were impressive. <clears throat> this, these are the students. Some of you may. May have, may have seen portions of the Sundance documentary. And they, they did a great job documenting the activities of these students without much added drama. They, they really did. They would just mic us and follow us with cameras and stay out of the way for the most part. Um, what's nice about the, the SIP system is we, have, we learned, we have some opportunity with puncture, with variation in cut. Right, we can be a little more playful. In fact, I think if we ever do this again, we should be more playful. Um, I think that we need to think a little more critically about the difference between a familiar opening and a like this, and the punched opening that was demonstrated in the previous uh, slide. But they've done a really great job with this strategy of understanding how important it is, for example, regarding neighborhood development, to mark the corner, like, like other buildings, mark the corner of a block. NHS continues to give us corner lots. They like what we do, and they, they understand that, that it's important to sort of start by redefining entire context, uh, entire blocks, one at a time. And they've done a great job with the scheme of, 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 again, understanding that we can relate to the neighboring homes without copying them directly. Um, collaboration was tough. The color selection was tough. I still, for the record, I, don't, I, I, do not like, I do not like the way this red worked out. But, that, but, but, but they, we call it the tomato house. They, they voted for this color, and that's a whole other discussion, right? Whether, whether you vote for a color because you like the color or whether you choose a color that has something more to do with the strategy. That's, that's a tough topic, <clears throat> a tough topic. But they, they did a great job, and, 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 and I'm, I'm really proud of this house. I'm proud of this group. Um, the interior finishes continue to improve each year. This is sophisticated. This is, this is they put the floor down. I mean, please uh, keep in mind, they build everything, except they don't do the electrical work, or the plumbing, or the mechanical. Everything else they do, from roofing, to, to flooring, to trim, to casing, to the making of the windows, to the installation of the windows, the flashing of the windows. Uh, it's an incredible educational opportunity. And, I want to end by, by, by talking about that, that issue. Um, you know, the students, we can, we can work with students and they can make great design decisions. And that's part of the, the response, responsibility we have as educators, right? To, to, to give students those opportunities to, to design things that they're excited about. And they tend to do it one at a time. They tend to do it alone at a desk in studio. But, but now that I'm working with groups of students, I don't know that I ever want to work with a student one at a time again, because it's really great to watch them learn qualities of, of, of diplomacy. It's really great to watch them learn how to 
respectfully hold their peers accountable. Um, we talked about this in the reviews today that I sat on. Uh, the, these students leave the program being able um, to function as incredible professionals, right, in the office place. They, they, they leave this program understanding how to collaborate with others. And I think that's, that's a must, much more important outcome than the fact that they made a cool house. I mean, I think that, that we're producing practitioners that will make many, many, many more, I think, cool houses, I hope. But thanks. Okay. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we can hear, I think. I have a logistics question. Who, who, who I'm over that? here. Hi. There you are. Hi. <laughs> um, who takes care, care of the bidding, like all of the materials? Who makes sure that everything gets delivered to the site on time so that everything can go up? Me? That's you. So you do the fun work. <laughs> yeah. We do that. I do that with Emily. and uh, Emily and I do that. Sam doesn't do that. Emily and I handle all of the, we handle all of the financing. We have, we have a really, it's really, we did it once, we, we developed an Excel spreadsheet that works, mm -hmm. and we, we, we use it every year. And so the next step for us is to look at the numbers from this house, see what worked, what didn't. Um, we have a contingency built in, so we have overruns in some areas, and we, when we have overruns, we've got to find ways to, to save money. With this product, at one point, we were really overspent, and, and I sent a couple of students out to gather donations and funding and they they did a great job do, you know getting they got all of the floor donated that that that's sustainable bamboo floor um, they got the glazing for the custom windows donated and it's really interesting when you, you we meet vendors every year that are thrilled to meet architecture students learning about their systems I mean they're thrilled I mean they're absolutely astonished and and they they step they step to the plate. They want to help. It's 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 great. But thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did you get through the historic preservation? What was the um, um, because if if there was an existing house on the site, we would either have to repair it. Um, no, we have to repair it. But in this neighborhood. If you're working on an empty lot, it's already empty. We have certain, um, there's some flexibility. So we have to show them drawings proving that we're, we're going to maintain the scale of the neighborhood, uh, use materials familiar in the neighborhood, um, maintain uh, programmatic uh, conditions such as porch and stoop. Um, they're really, and they're good, they're, they're really interested in things like the window detail. They don't want us to use a standard nail fin application where you cut a hole in the wall, slap the window into that hole, and, and, and end up with it sticking out past the face. So we have to we develop deep uh, uh, jam conditions. That's not it. That's a different that's a different detail. But in the first house, in that first neighborhood, we, we developed a recessed window application, and they, and they're they're sophisticated. They they do understand. They they truly understand the difference between replication and, and preservation. So they, they're not asking us to, to disnify the neighborhood. And, and they understand that if we, if we stepped in and made, and we mimicked what's there uh, cheaply, it would discredit the authenticity of what's there already. And, and they're, they, they get that. They're really, they're really good about that. So do you have, I mean, do you have those problems here? Or? Oh, I'm just imagining. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. By the preservationist, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 a great question, and and I have to figure out how to say this politely, um, without getting myself in trouble. In these poor neighborhoods, look, these are these are tough neighborhoods. These are inner city neighborhoods. We have in these neighborhoods an average of one murder per day, and this is tough. This, these are tough places. Um, 
There's a huge drug culture there. Those are the people who live in these neighborhoods. The preservationists don't all live in these neighborhoods. They want to move into the neighborhoods, but they're not willing to move in and stay claim until it's a safer place. So they want their cake and eat it too. And it gets me a little bit riled up. So um, the community, when I say that the community embraces these things, I think if we were to step in, not, not all members of the community think this way. I mean, it's, it's a mixed bag. But people who are my age and younger, you know, early 40s and younger, they love that we're stepping in and offering them something they can call theirs. That we're not just trying to, to replicate, let's say, examples of a culture that existed in, 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 in 1895. And for the population of these neighborhoods, their life or the life of their ancestors in the year 1895 was quite different from the life of my ancestors. In, in 1895, right? And, and so they're, they're quite proud to have these. And, and let me tell you, they, they, they look after. These, these are predominantly African-American communities. They look after us. We've not had any students uh, get into trouble or be harmed. We've, we've had very little theft. Uh, they sit outside while we're working all day long, and they keep an eye on us. And, and, they, and they understand this issue of, 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 of mutual respect. And um, there are times when, when there are some individuals approaching the site that, that are maybe suspicious, and, and these, these characters in the neighborhood handle that for us. I mean, I shouldn't admit what goes on, but it's, it's rough. I mean, it, it, involves, it involves pieces of metal and things like that, let's say. It, it's, it's, it's tough. But, how yeah. many of these are sold? <clears throat> you, how many of, your... of the four, two are sold. The greenhouse that was done by uh, Cole McCoker um, happens to sit um, on a corner that's, that's tough. That's the one we went to. And so, for example, the, the, the greenhouse, I didn't show that house um, t today. Um, the house that Cole McCoker worked on is on a corner across the street from a, a little corner grocery store where they peddle drugs pretty actively. And um, last week, it was discovered that pit bulls were being raised in the backyard. The neighbors had taken down the fences of, ad of adjacent properties. We're driving through this corner urban build lot, through the backyard to gain access to their rear lots. And then we, they found um, ammunition and, and weapons and drug paraphernalia stored underneath the house. So they're cleaning that up, they're cleaning that up now and they're, and they're trying to get it back on the market. And um, there's, there's some positions, some, you know, some, some people ask, why, why are you doing this for these people who don't seem to care? And the answer is because there are some who do care, right? There, there are some who do care. And, and it's easy for the, um, for the news shows to broadcast the, the most dramatic events. They don't, they, don't, they don't broadcast the more common events of these neighborhoods. There are many great people who live in these, these neighborhoods. They're, they're just underprivileged, and they've not, they've not been um, exposed to the upbringing that some of us have been exposed to. They, they, they don't have um, the background that, that many of us in this room have. And um, our, I think our job is to, to give them something. Good. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's tricky. The day that we start studio, I um I'll, I'll let them know that we're going to run this studio like an office. And I'll let them know that, that I will be respectful and diplomatic, but but I'm in charge, right? So I'm able to sort of keep a heavy hand on on how things go. Um, they each develop a scheme um, at the very beginning. And after one week, a week and a half, we lay those schemes out on a table side by side. And I, as the director, combine like schemes. 
So I'll take all similar schemes, put them together, and that forms a team. And they work as a team. Uh, and then, so we might reduce 12 projects to three or four. Sounds familiar to some people, right? We, we'll reduce them to three or four. Those teams work. Then we look at those three or four projects, and there's a vote. I immediately dismantle the teams. We vote. I might, I might keep a couple of, key, of the key players, meaning a couple of the people that instigated the, the selective scheme. I might keep them on the construction document team, but not all of them. And then I'll pull in others to that team. So let's say I reduced, uh, I have now a group of six working on the construction documents and we're at midterm. The other six students, I find tasks for them. And that's when I have to work as a, uh, a parent, more or less, as patronizing as that might sound. I mean, by this point, I understand the students. I understand that some are more patient than others. I understand that, that some have certain interests. And, and, and it's my job to kind of match my observations with the needs of the studio. And, and I sort of, um, you know, so some students get into marketing, some students get into material research, some students continue to develop some of the prototypes that were still good but not selected. And it works. It works. And at the end of the design semester, not every member of the design studio goes on to build. A number of them do, but then in the in the spring semester, we're joined by outsiders, people who did not, who were not involved in the design at all. They come on because they want to build a house. And all of a sudden, by, by the time we get to January, by the time we get to the, to the beginning of the building, it's one, it's one group project. They all, they all share authorship. And so far it works, you know. Um, some, students, some, some students bruise easily and they don't heal quickly. Um, some continue to pout. I've had one student where he never cheered up, and so I just gave him not so much fun stuff to do. I mean, I mean, I mean, not to be not to be an ass, but I'm like, if you can't grow up and 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 be part of the team, then then here, I want you to print this. I want you to make Xeroxes for me all semester. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 honest, right? I mean, I, I have. I have really very little tolerance for, um, for that kind of activity. I'm, I'm like, like, we got to get this done. And that can, be, that can be a little bit difficult sometimes, but not always. But, all right. Thank you. Yep, thanks.